people think that's so strange because I think that you're right. A lot of people, they start out with just re- conventional, like a spinning reel or something, and then they get into fly after that. But I never did. I mean, I just always have just fly fished. I don't even know how to use a spinning reel. You've never used one? Nope. Really? Mm-hmm. So, and I grew up on a lake, so <laughs> go figure. So did you not fish? No, I didn't. So I have a younger brother and a younger sister, and they always were on the water fishing. And I was always on the water, but I was swimming or skiing or diving. Um, my dad owns a scuba diving charter, and so we were always diving. And my dad's whole side of the family lives on the lake, so all of our cousins were always there. And so we just did that, and I was more... I spent a lot of time in the dance studio, and when I was in the water, I was swimming. I was not fishing. Where my brother and my sister, big fisher, you know, big anglers, fishermen. So, so you were swimming. They were trying to. They yeah. Were trying to basically, fish. Oh, my brother was always like <laughs> trying to catch me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, welcome in everybody. This is uh, David Perry at Southeastern Fly. You're listening to the Anglers Influence, and we're talking with Jen Ripple uh, from Dunn Magazine. You're the editor, and are you the owner and editor? And I'm the owner and editor-in-chief of and, Dunn Magazine. And everything else. Yeah. yeah. You name it. <laughs> <laughs> I do it. So talk a little bit about Dunn. Let's, let's talk about that. Now, I've, I've heard some of them and, and read the magazine, but talk just a little bit about it and tell us kind of how it evolved and started and evolved and where you are now. Yeah, so Dunn is an international fly fishing lifestyle magazine, and the vast majority of our authors are women everyday women. So the way it started was I was working with a magazine. I was writing a woman's column for a Midwest fly fishing magazine called A Tight Loop. And I went to go write, I wanted to write an article for a woman's magazine. And I looked for one and there wasn't one. So I thought, well, if I'm missing it, other people will be too. So I created it. And so from that point forward, I guess it was a missing link, so to speak. And people have really liked it. And we went from being just a digital magazine to being a print magazine that you can buy in the store now and the print is like really i don't know all the terminology of print but it's really nice paper and the really good pictures and just it's high quality yeah yeah it, they call it a bookazine i guess is what it's technically called yeah and it's uh recycled papers and vegetable inks and just uh, we're known for our photography just beautiful photographs and what i love about it is everybody always says to me oh you have the best photographs you know you must have a fabulous photographer and I do he actually lives here in Dover with with you know in this area he moved here to be near the magazine but uh, the vast majority of our photographs come from everyday anglers who submit their stories so those are just authors photographs for the most part there's some really good in in the listening in the audience out there the folks that listen to the podcast there are some really good photographers out there that, and some can do it with their iPhone, and you, you just think, wow, I don't know how you did that. I've taken that shot a hundred times. Yeah. And a hundred times it didn't turn out as good as what they can do. So people with an eye like yeah. like that are, are oh, invaluable, sure. especially I would assume with a magazine. Yeah, and print is so much different than a digital magazine. You know, a digital magazine, you can have lower quality photos, and they still look good online, but print is a whole different animal. I bet it is, and mm-hmm. I've, never, I've never thought of that. So you, we did a... Uh, we were at a an event in Murfreesboro. Uh, at a we were at a brewery down there, and you gave me one of the magazines. I was like, okay, and I was going to North Georgia, like the next day, that mm-hmm. next morning, I think. And I took it to the cabin that we were staying in, and I probably read it throughout the whole couple of days that we were down there, and then I just left it there. And I was like, this would be I could you know because there's a fly fishing cabin, obviously. Uh-huh. I thought I'm just going to leave this here for the next wow. person. I appreciate that. Yeah, cool. So you don't you don't ever know. I didn't. Nobody knows I did that except for me and you. Now yeah. we, we know. But, cool. Uh, but yeah, so so if you have a done magazine when you get finished reading it, if you want to leave it for the next person, I think that's a good. idea. That's kind of recycling, isn't it? That's right. It is recycling, <laughs> and I like that. So you uh, started started swimming and stuff in a lake. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, I grew up on a small lake in Wisconsin and um you know my mom was the type that said you you know you are not going to watch that TV. Everybody would die to live where you live. Get outside and go play on that lake. So we were just expected to be gone boating or swimming or you know doing whatever it was that we were going to do out on the lake and on the water outside. That's just how I grew up. Yeah, I grew up in Michigan and we didn't play inside. We played outside. Yeah. Yeah. We, there were ponds around, and we fished the ponds, and we swam in them. We waded in them. In the winters, we would ride our bicycles on them and skate and play hockey. Yeah. Yeah, all of that. Yeah. So we were expected to stay outside, too. 
if you didn't fish growing up, so tell tell me how you started then. <laughs> yeah. So um, I was living in Ann Arbor at the time, and it was a really cold winter, and I didn't really have anything to do. And so I looked online to see like what there was to do in the area, and there was a fly tying class. And honestly, it was super cheap. It was like eight classes for 65 bucks or something like that. And I thought, well, I don't know if I'll like it or not, but I may as well just go try and see what this is like. I'm not the type to... You know, no offense to someone who really likes to crochet or something, but that's just not who I am. And so I thought, well, this is a little interesting. And so I went to the fly tying class. And from the moment I walked in the fly shop, I just loved it. And then I just like, it was like a black hole. Every, everything about my world changed and I was obsessed with this thing called fly fishing and so that was in the winter and so when the ice was off the Huron River which runs through the campus of the University of Michigan um, I d- would just leave work and I would just go put my waders on and just stand in the river for hours and teach myself to fish. So you're you're living in uh, Ann Arbor All right. about mm-hmm. what stage of life are you in then? Uh, I was divorced and then had moved to Ann Arbor and took a job there. Okay. Mm-hmm. Were, you, were you at the college? Uh, I was at the Kellogg Eye Center. Okay. All right. Yeah. So is you, so where do you fish there? Uh, the Huron River is right through the campus, and it's a smallmouth river. Explains your love for smallmouth That's a little right. bit, doesn't it? That's what I learned on. In fact, I had been fishing for a couple of years before someone told me, well, you're supposed to catch trout with a fly rod. And I was like, I am? <laughs> I don't even know what a trout is. <laughs> I, I love to tell somebody, yeah, I'm going to to um, to Florida for for fi- to fish for tarpon, which I need to catch one. You haven't uh, caught one yet? No, oh. I have not. It's been it's like that one thing that's it, it's evading me. Mm-hmm. You have to go to Tabasco, Mexico. Yeah, I need to try something different, mm-hmm. or I need to really get serious about it and go for like two weeks or so. So surely, out of two weeks of fishing, maybe I can catch one. Yeah, but well, you'd catch hundreds if you went to Tabasco. Really? Yeah. So let's talk about that just a uh-huh. before we yeah. get too far into this. Yeah, I want to hear about that. Yeah, so Tabasco, Mexico is um, right by where Campeche is. And so in the old days, Campeche used to be the place for juvenile tarpon. And so this is actually a river system that runs through. It's the second largest river in Mexico. And um, there's a father and son who guide there. They on the fly for tarpon, and so when Tabasco, Mexico, when they this father and son went to the city of Tabasco or the whatever it is, it's county or something, province, um, they said we have this big fishery here, and we think that we could bring in tourism. You know, people would want to fish here with a fly rod, and the dad was like the TV personality. Um, for a fishing personality in Mexico at that time, in Tabasco, and he had a TV show, and so the son had picked up a fly rod and somehow found my name, and he uh, contacted me and said, hey, we have this fishery here, and we really want you to come and see if it's, you know, if you think it could be a destination place. And so I went down there, and they, he said it was tarpon, and that it was more tarpon than you could ever imagine, and I thought, oh, you know, I, okay, <laughs> I know what this is like, right? But I thought, well, all right, we'll go down there. So we went down there, and literally, you know how you just kind of like take your line and you cast it out once just to stretch it out, and then you pile it all at your feet? Well, the second my my fly hit the water, I had a tarpon on. It was crazy. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, just hundreds of tarpon boiling at the surface of the water all over the place. Wow. So I think, you know, if you haven't caught a tarpon and tarpon is on your bucket list, that it's it takes all the intimidation away from catching your first tarpon. Okay. Yeah. I've had them on. I've lost them. I've had cut lines, all that. And just, like I said, it's just that fish that that is evading me right now. I'm not going to say that evades me because it's not going to forever. Right. Because I'm going to catch one. That's right. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you'll catch hundreds of them there. I mean, as many as you can pull in, you can catch. It's crazy. I'd really like to do, like, catch small tarpon on a six weight too i wanted that's that is on my bucket list and uh-huh. I, you know like i guess back in the everglades or wherever you're supposed to go for that yeah tabasco um, i'm telling you it's the best place i've ever been for a juvenile tarpon that's fishery. what i need yeah. to do then so you're fishing for smallmouth let's go back to that just a second you're fishing for smallmouth in Ar- ann arbor and somebody says you're supposed to be supposed to be fishing for trout right right and i and i was like uh i am uh no one told me that and you know and still today it's funny when you meet somebody we do a lot of conventional shows um and put a fly rod in the hands of conventional anglers for a whole weekend in like um new jersey and then in chicago and and it's funny these guys always say you can't fish for you can't fish for smallmouth with a fly rod or you can't saltwater fish with a fly rod and i'm thinking well how else would you do it <laughs> <laughs> Because I don't know any other way. <laughs> and and if you if you ever fish with those folks that 
like bass fishermen and stuff like that once you teach them to fly fish like to cast Mm -hmm. like get get all the gear mentality of casting out of their head and put in their head how to cast a fly rod Mm -hmm. once you see them switch over from being a new beginner and this can happen in a day so if i get somebody on the boat that that uh that i'm that bass fishes or something once they figure out how to cast a fly rod and they start fishing they are a whole other animal oh yeah i mean they start fishing and they figure out all right if, if i'm nymphing here's the way i need to do it if i'm you know in a lake so i've got a bass lake that i have access to and you get them up on the lake and they start really fishing like they would conventional and i mean they light up like little kids mm-hmm. and it's so much fun so that that whole well i don't know if i can fish with a fly rod for bass completely leaves them oh yeah and when that happens they're just like marshmallows in your hand (laughs) yeah well you know and i find that you know when i moved here it was like a real eye-opener because kentucky lake is where all the big bass tournaments are right so right i mean there are anglers bass anglers who win a million dollars right in my backyard here and so watching them i've never really been around conventional anglers like i am now and so watching a bass angler a conventional bass angler is really it's given me a whole new perspective on them. You know, I used to be, uh, I think I was one of those like elitist fly anglers that was very exclusive and was like, oh, I would never fish with anything but a fly rod, right? Um, And then watching them, I think we don't give them, as fly anglers, we don't give conventional gear anglers as much credit as we should because, and I'll tell you, those bass anglers out there right now, if, if the water temperature is 64 degrees and it's a random Thursday and the wind is running, you know, <laughs> is blowing five miles an hour from the south, they know exactly where those bass are going to be. But a fly angler out here would be like, oh, I'm just going to throw to the shore and then strip it back and throw to the shore and strip it back, you know. And, and so you're not going to be successful um, as a fly angler in big bass water like Kentucky Lake if you don't know where the fish are and these can these gear guys they know where they are and in fact i just got a new trolling motor and a new hummingbird because i'm gonna a lot of fly anglers don't even ever think about using electronics and i i think you're missing the boat especially when you fish big water i don't have the hummingbird on the drift boat and i don't i don't have all that stuff Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that i can't read the terrain and how it comes how that ridge comes into the water and how those two ridges come together and then that little creek that comes in between them feeds into the lake or feeds into the whatever it is i'm fishing Mm so it's like anything else the more knowledge you have the better you're going to be yeah the more successful you're going to be right absolutely so let's talk about your first influence since since this is influence uh let's talk about your first influence here Mm -hmm. uh about about who who do you think maybe at a young age maybe at a, as a as a young fly angler, uh, who would you say would be an influence that kind of started you moving in the direction? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I think my first influence influencers, because there's two of them, would be my, my maternal and my paternal grandmothers. Um, and I didn't fish when I was a child, but I give them, looking back now, I give them a lot of credit for influencing my life because, you know, my grandmother on my mom's side, she was from Russia, and she was a, a pianist who was trained in Vienna and lived through the war. My mom is, you know, I'm first generation American. My mom is also born in Russia, and she was in a displaced persons camp. And so my grandmother, you know, saw the horrors of war in Russia, and but before that was an avid, avid angler. And so she came to the United States. My mom came to the United States, my great-grandmother, and then my uncle. They all came um, right after World War II. And when they came here, they my mom spoke seven languages, none of which was English, and they just had this will to survive, right? And they were in America, which was so amazing to them, and they had left their whole world behind. And my mom tells a story when she was she remembers coming in on the boat, coming into Ellis Island, and she people saw the torch of the Statue of Liberty and people were screaming and yelling and jumping up and down and crying. And my mom, she was like four, she said to my grandmother, I don't want to go here. I don't want to go here. And my grandmother said, why? And she said, because this place makes people crazy. (laughs) And my grandmother said, no, this is no more papers at gunpoint. This is no more raids in the middle of the night. This is freedom. And so I grew up with this very, you know, big responsibility on my shoulders to keep freedom what it is right and so and to be able to make the most of what 
I can with what I'm given because my ancestors didn't have that ability. And so my grandmother, when she specifically, uh, her name's Tatiana Sadovnikova, she came here and she died when I was seven. And she died of cancer because of things that they had done to them during the war. She was a very avid fly angler. And I didn't know this until I started fly fishing. And I feel like there's part of her that runs through my veins. And then on my dad's side, you know, my grandmother, Mert Ripple, was the instrumental woman in my little hometown of West Bend, Wisconsin. She foresaw, you know, having a place where you would want to be on the water. And so she bought up a lot of property around this lake that basically my dad's side of the family owns this little lake in West Bend now. Uh, They have so much property on it. And because she said she always wanted a ripple on the water, and that gave, you know, me the ability to grow up near water. And, you know, she used to say, when you live on a lake, you have water in your veins. And so I think that those two influences kind of directed me to a place in my life where I did pick up a fly rod when I was 38 years old, you know, I mean, I was older when I picked up a fly rod. And so I haven't been fishing for a very, very long time, you know, like 12 years or so. I just gave everybody my age. Um, But, (laughs) (laughs) but, um, you know, so for me, I, I think those those two influencers were really where it started, and I didn't even realize it was starting back then. So you you grew up on on a lake. What was the name of the town? It's West Bend, Wisconsin. So you know if you've ever had a popcorn popper or a microwave or West Bend Company, yeah. that was in West Bend, Wisconsin. Okay, mm-hmm. it's All forty right. miles north of Milwaukee. It's interesting. You were talking about growing up on a lake, growing up on the water. Water runs through your veins, mm-hmm. and then you walk in a fly shop. And you instantly go, oh wow, right? You know, I don't know, I don't know if you put those two together in your mind, subconscious, or yeah, no, it wasn't. It's not until I look back on it, right, and see the progression and see where my love was for it. But it was just, it was that you know when they talk about it grabbing you, something grabbing you, it did. I mean, from that moment forward, there was nothing I I would dream about it. I would, I knew I had a real issue when I was driving from Ann Arbor back to Chicago. I used to drive every other weekend, and I was driving back to Chicago, and there was a dead deer on the side of the road and I thought, ooh, should I pull over and take that tail? And I thought, I have got an issue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in fly fishing circles, you really wouldn't have an issue. No, they would They would think it was ridiculous that I didn't pick that up. Yeah, normal everyday people would think that was a little strange. But, yeah, but yeah. my girlfriends that, that don't fish and my, fr- my guy friends who don't fish, they think it's crazy, my obsession with fly fishing. In fact, when I went back to my class reunion, I only went to one class reunion. It was my 30th class reunion. It was a couple of years ago. And uh, the guys, the big quote was, well, we figured we would have a professional angler in our class. We just never thought it would be you. And I was like, no one expected that more than me. I would never have expected that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and we were talking a little bit before the before we started recording this and was telling you that my grandparents in, influenced me and your grandmothers influenced you and you remember that and mm-hmm. they, they do it a little differently. I think that they do it in a way that you just really latch on to and you probably I'm gonna probably remember it all my life about how my grandmother's influenced my fly fishing. Like one thing, there's always there's always gonna be chocolate on my boat. Always. <laughs> In the cooler. You will you will always if you don't I just flat out forgot it and I don't forget it often. But that's because my grandmother always had M and M's and and Snickers and Milky Ways and her and whenever I would fish with them we would go to Real Foot, which Real Foot isn't really that far as far as a crow flies from here. Yeah, no. Uh, we would go over there, and when fishing would get get slow, she would pull out some chocolate, and we'd eat it and pass a little bit of time. Then we'd go back to fishing. You'd, you know, you'd start catching fish again. Mm-hmm. And so just little things like that start kind of tweaking your thoughts. And, and Yeah, uh, and I think, you know, like my one grandmother who died, you know, when I was young, um, I have very limited memories of her, and so... I think this is the way that maybe I keep her alive because she wasn't around for the vast majority of my life. And then my other grandmother died, you know, probably 10 years ago or so. And and she was always instrumental because she lived down the street from me, right? We all lived on the same lake. So we were always outside and she was always just fun and you know, always had cookies in the cookie jar for us and that kind of stuff. And so I think, you know, the water is just in my family's veins. I mean, with the name of Ripple, how can it not be? <laughs> Every time I speak, someone always asks, is that your real last name? I'm like, yes, that is actually the name I was born with. <laughs> not a stage name. Nope. Nope, we're not doing country music here. No, we are not. We're in the area of country music, but we're not doing it. <laughs> yeah, thank God you would not want to hear me sing. <laughs> <laughs> so you were... You were uh in Ann Arbor when you started and you walk into a fly shop to take a fly tying class yeah without ever fly fishing before I think that's that's different than what most that's most folks somebody puts a fly rod in their hand they go crazy over it 
They decided they want to tie their own flies to save money. You know, and I told that same lie to myself and my wife. It's such a yeah, that's such a fallacy. Yeah, and, but yours was you took a fly tying class. Yep. I mean, it was really cold. I just needed something to do, and I had at the time just broken up with my boyfriend, and I really, you know, was like by myself there in Ann Arbor, and the class was just at this really cool shop. Had two shop dogs, you know, and this really great guy, and that was that owned the shop and was just very personable and very welcoming, you know, to me as a woman. And I just fell in love with everything that there was about it. So yeah, I tied flies for man months before the ice was actually off the Huron River so I could actually fish. <laughs> when we grew up in Midland, Michigan, and that's that's it. I mean, you just, you find other things to do until it's spring and then summer. Right. Like ride snowmobiles and ice fish, which I never, I never could get into ice fishing. I'm sorry. I just couldn't do it. Yeah, no. I would skate play hockey that sort of thing yeah but so you, you're tying flies so when did you pick up your first fly rod and actually get to cast it and start fishing um so that was going to be in the spring then so right after i learned to tie flies then that probably april and may i just i had bought one online i bought a fly rod off of craigslist because you know well i didn't know if i was really going to love it or not wasn't going to sp- and they were expensive they're still expensive right and so just picked up a five weight. I figured a five weight would be about what I would want to fish for a smallmouth in this little river with. And so I just started teaching myself to cast and teaching myself to fish. Didn't know what flies I was supposed to use. Went to Cabela's, bought some flies. You know, I was tying some, but didn't really know exactly what to fish with. I mean, I knew how to tie the flies, but didn't know what bass really were going to eat or anything like that. So went to Cabela's and they put some in my hands and that I deconstructed and then tied my own, you know. But yeah, I started fishing. And and then what was really instrumental for me and why, you know, I think Ann Arbor is one of my influencers is because there's a group called the Michigan Fly Girls. And they were started by a woman uh, named Dorothy Schramm and uh, her friend Ann Miller. And uh, two amazing women, and they actually did a woman's only fly casting class. And I took that class, and I would not be where I am today, I don't think, because if it hadn't been for that. Because, you know, fly fishing, even though men are really, really nice, and they don't try they don't try to, like, you know, exclude women in this, because it's so still male-dominated, it can be intimidating. And I think that having an all-woman's class, even though I'm a very strong woman and I'm not easily intimidated, for whatever reason, I just would have never taken a casting class if it was held by a man or a co-ed. And so I took their class and it taught me just leaps and bounds about, you know, fishing and my and my cast. And then I, you know, I, I found other women that I could fish with in the area. And that really is what propelled me to the next level and really influenced me and really, really got me involved. I mean, I really wanted to uh, fish all the time. I was obsessed by it, but this gave me another opportunity to actually get out there and learn about it and learn the entomology. Ann Miller actually wrote a book on entomology fishing in the Midwest rivers and um, and lakes, and so she did a, the whole. She's very very knowledgeable, and so that was a whole. You know, I love that about fly fishing, right? It's like you can learn something and you never stop learning. And so the entomology was just another way to get involved. And the more I learned about it, the more well rounded I became as an angler, and then the more I could pursue it. You know, thinking about the listener out there that's driving in their car or on their way to the river, we hope, mm-hmm. uh, or mowing the yard because mm-hmm. we listen to podcasts mowing the yard now. What do you think Ann Arbor taught you that you could pass along to them? Yeah, I think it taught me a couple things. It taught me that, yes, you can go out there and do it yourself. You don't have to be a great angler in order to catch fish. I was by no means a good angler when I when I started fishing. I didn't know what I was doing. And guess what? Bass was a great way to learn because they're aggressive and they like flies. And they taught me everything I needed to know about, you know, landing a fish and hooking a fish and, and the flies to use. And then, you know, it's the camaraderie of fellow angler, someone that's your friend that you can go with. That makes it much more fun, I think. You know, and as a woman, it gave me a safety net. I felt like I could be on the river and not be afraid. You know, Ann Arbor has a transient population and they sit underneath the viaducts in the areas that I fished in the Huron River had transient populations on the river. And when I was there by myself, I would think twice about going out, right? Because I'm by myself and I'm not a very big woman. And and these were um, people that could have they were scary to me. And so when I was fishing with someone else, I'd found someone else camaraderie. Um, I felt more confident and I felt more secure. And I, and I think too, I did a lot of, I did a lot of 
lessons when I was there and I didn't know what I was doing, but that was okay. I took people fishing. I didn't like charge for lessons or anything, but when I look back, I taught a lot of people. I put a lot of a fly rod in a lot of people's hands just because I was on the river every day. And you don't have to be an experienced angler in order to get someone else involved in the sport. And I think that was what, if, when I look back, I think that's what Ann Arbor taught me. That that showed me that I had the ability to teach someone else and pass my craft along to someone else, even if I wasn't an expert at it. You know, if you want to, if you want to see, if you understand something, try to teach it to somebody. Yeah. And if you understand it, you'll be able to do that. You'll be able to show them, you'll be able to talk your way through it. You'll be able to talk them through it. So true. That, yeah, it makes you a much better angler too, if you teach someone it absolutely does and and so you're talking about the friendships that you made it's it's interesting and i've said this before this isn't anything new but it's interesting my friends that i have close friends that i fish with we're very different uh in so many ways most of them are much smarter than me probably probably all of them Uh, (laughs) but we can talk and we've become very good friends because we have the the river in common and fly fishing in common and then we find out that we have a lot of things in common, but this passion, sport, pastime, lifestyle, whatever you want to call it, brings people together and you learn from each other. And, it, you know, sometimes the trip to the river is kind of helps you a little more than actually spending some time on the water on some days, you know, yeah. a trip to the river where you talk about things that you talk about, whatever that is. Right. With good friends that fly fish, you get into some deep conversations and you can solve some world problems, you know, while yeah. you're at it and some yeah. life problems for sure. Uh, especially if they might have been through it and you haven't been through it yet, you know, to get some get some ideas of what you might want to do for whatever it is. Right. Well, you know, and I think water seeks its own level, right? So people that are involved in fly fishing, I find, are very like-minded and uh, decent people. And so, you know, you tend to, like like I said, water seeks its own level. So you tend to be with people that are like you and are of like mind. And, and But I do think that fly fishing is very, it's a very cohesive sport. It brings people together. It doesn't matter what your socioeconomic background is or what your, you know, gender is or what your political beliefs are. You know, you get to the water and you find this love of fly fishing and it's a commonality and it, it brings people together. And, and I love that about the sport. I mean, I really, I, I think that I... When when I look back on my friends now, I, I don't know that I have a lot of friends who are not fishy friends. It's just the way it just turned out, you know? It just happens that yeah. way, don't, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And I, you get immersed. I get immersed in guiding and you get immersed in the magazine. So you the really tight friends that you had before that are still around. You know, you still have them. Yeah. But as your friendships grow, they just grow more over into the fly fishing in the industry and then people you meet on the water and I've met some really cool people on the water that live in live in near Nashville. You meet people yeah. that are in the business and, and you know and everybody's a manager in Nashville, you know. But yep. really, everybody's connected some way to yeah. the music business, yeah. Yeah. Or the, or they know somebody that uh-huh. is, but you get to know some people and you're like, Wow, that was really a can't believe i just met them and uh-huh. you know they're saying i can't believe i just met david I, you know they went home and told their wife i right. just met david perry you yeah know, i'm kidding i'm sure they did <laughs> <laughs> they don't say that uh, they might you never know <laughs> <laughs> they'd leave a lead a dull life if they said that <laughs> so so ann arbor is is for those that are listening that aren't sure where Ann Arbor is and don't don't turn off the podcast to go to Google we'll tell you where it is uh, so Michigan is shaped like a hand like your left hand right so where is Ann Arbor um so it's about maybe 45 miles west of Detroit maybe maybe a little bit further than that but uh not far from Detroit okay so it's more is it more toward the middle or the western yeah, side it's more it's towards the middle toward the middle mm-hmm. so the rivers flow to Lake Michigan there right mm-hmm. okay all right I don't know where the boundary is where they start kind of flowing to well, the east. The Huron, the Huron is right there as well. So, okay. Lake Huron. So, and I, I love Michigan. I love going back up there, and I love fishing. I love going, you know, up past Traverse City. Really, yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, it just is. It really is. And this is southeastern fly, but still, we can we can talk about <laughs> we can talk about the north a little bit if we want to, because mm-hmm. uh, there's some great great freshwater fishing up there. You uh, your grandmother's uh, influenced you, and then Ann Arbor. It's really where you get started, and there's a lot of new there. Uh, yeah, and I do a lot of t- I do a lot of learning there. You know, I did a lot of uh, studying of the waters and you know, how to read water and uh, what flies to use for bass and casting lessons and that kind of stuff. And that kind of built my foundation. So, who who would you say after you after that after Ann Arbor? Tell me, 
tell me who it is that you think might might have shaped your fly fishing a little, even oh, a little yeah. more. Oh, I know who it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I moved from Ann Arbor and I moved back to Chicago. And when I moved back to Chicago, I lived in this area called The Circle. It's uh, right out it's in the city proper, but out a little bit west. And uh, on the little circle that I lived on, there was a tiny little rod building fly shop. It was so random for in this area of Chicago. There's nothing really around there. It's not a place where there are a lot of stores or anything. It would not be considered a commercial area. And so this little fly shop there was just so random. But I went there, and I uh, that would be my new local fly shop. And so I went in there, and the guy who owns it, Eric, he said, hey, there's a new magazine that just came out online. It's called A Tight Loop. You should check it out. And uh, the guy who owns it is actually going to do a fly tying class here, and I know that you like to tie flies. So you should come. And I said, okay, I will. So I did. I came. And uh, the guy who was leading it, his name is Kurt Coppola, and he owned the magazine. He's the genius behind it. It was an online magazine, Midwest Fly Fishing Magazine. And it was right in the time when, you know, page turning magazines online, that was not existent. He wrote every single line of code in order to create that page turning thing online. And he's brilliant, the smartest man I've ever met. And he, um, he has a physics background. He's crazy smart, you know. And he, uh, asked me after I'd been tying flies for a little bit there and I got to know him a little bit he asked me if I wanted to write for his magazine a woman's column and so I said yeah and but the articles I was writing were very like double entendre like a typical woman's column in a man's magazine back then and so it was like stuff like the sex hatch and that those kind of articles and so I really wanted to write I like to write um, and I wanted to write for a woman's magazine, and so I looked around for one, and there wasn't one. So I went to Kurt and said, hey, what do you think about helping me you know, start a magazine? And so it was the intention was only to be online because I'm very conservation-minded, and you know, back then you would think it, I don't want to use paper and that kind of stuff. And so and really recycled papers and vegetable inks were not a thing back when the magazine first came out in 2013 as much as they are now. And if they were, they were super, super expensive. So I was just going to do online, and I'd like to say that now it was genius and I'd planned it all, but I just really got lucky, right? I uh, I wanted to be online, and now looking back, it, it really helped the print magazine because I could reach a broader audience, I could reach a bigger audience for a lot less money or no money, right? And uh, so Kurt, he really was an influencer for me uh, not only is he an excellent, excellent angler, and he's been fishing for 30 years, he is just brilliant. And so he already knew how to put a magazine together. And it's really not about what you know, it's about who you know, right? And so knowing him really was the reason that I could even have a magazine that's out there now. And so apart from being a great drift boat rower and uh, a great angler, he taught me, you know, he's always, he was always saying to me, uh, you're dropping your back cast, you're dropping your back cast. And I'd say, I'm not dropping my back cast. And he'd say, yes, you are, you're dropping your back cast. And then, you know, he did the whole, like, got the little phone out there and videotaped me and was like, you know, I was, after I got over being angry. It's almost hurtful, <laughs> it isn't is, it? <laughs> I saw that I was painting an igloo, right? I was not... <laughs> I was dropping my back cast just like he said I was and so you know he's that person that can really be brutally honest with me whether I like it or not he doesn't care and so he's just going to say it and he's made me a much better angler so other than dropping your back cast what else do you think you and the magazine obviously Uh what else do you think you and being a like you said a, a rower which somebody that can row a boat yeah it's just worth their weight in gold that's right <laughs> <laughs> what what else uh what else do you think he taught you taught you as far as the fly fishing you know he, fly fishing goes? he really taught me how to fish for big fish uh it's it's a totally different thing when you have to use a sinking line or you're throwing big streamers or how to read the water in a lake you know you say you can see the seams but you know that's a learned behavior to see where the river comes in or the creek comes into the lake and know that there's going to be a shelf there i mean i had no idea you know i fished in in the rivers in you know in the huron river i had just waited i hadn't he taught me how to you know when you're in a boat it's a whole different animal and i think that people that wait a lot they don't or have never been in a drift boat they don't realize how different that is and so being able to teach someone how to you know patiently uh cast 
with the different angles when you're in a boat because especially as fly anglers you know a lot of people I've been in a boat with a lot of people that I've had to I've sat in the back specifically so I could see where the line was going and I've spent my day ducking right (laughs) (laughs) and you have too because you guide yes Yes. Uh, Yes. people don't think about the angles and so with his you know physics background he was really good at describing not only the the cast you know the way that a fly rod works and the way that your cast has to be in order to make a very efficient cast but he taught me things like double hauling which is really an important skill to learn i mean if you don't know it it's hard to learn at first but it's like patting your head and rubbing your stomach but once you get it it makes for a much more efficient cast and so and he's been he's just been a really good uh, teacher, uh, patience has been really, really big. I can tend to be a little bit uh, abrupt. He's much nicer than I am. <laughs> You're talking about double hauling. The guy that in uh, Knoxville that influenced me, we were fishing. We fished everywhere, all over East Tennessee, some of the places I couldn't even get back to today. But he would double haul in the mountains. But he would double haul for, you know, for 10, for three feet. You mm-hmm. would see him still double hauling. I mean, Pat, why are you double hauling? He said, that's just the way that I fish. And it, you know, it's just a different delivery. And he could do it and still line a, land a dry fly in a pool, and you would just see the fly land. You wouldn't hardly see the line or anything. So double hauling, that's very important. Even if you're fishing in the Smokies, it can be important in certain places. Uh, if you're not just, you know, high sticking and dabbing here and there. But someone that can take you and, and teach you how to do those things like you just described or mm-hmm. they're invaluable yeah for sure you know and and all of us have that thing that we can teach someone else you know that's the big thing that's what an influencer does right they teach you something and they don't have to be an expert at it but there's just something that just sticks and that's double haul for me i mean i double haul all the time it's just it doesn't have to be for for a long distance it doesn't right. have to be for distance it's just makes your cast more efficient yeah and we all want a more efficient cast yeah because the the more efficient you are the more fresh you are at the end of the day right you know you may be seven and a half hours into an eight hour float and if you're not fresh you're going to miss that fish that just happens to be the best one of the day that you can either get get your picture taken with or or enjoy the release or that'll be the one that got away and you'll be the one that is in your nightmares yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah, right exactly i had one of those yesterday oh did you oh (laughs) man yeah well you know i find that i miss fish when uh, for two reasons i'm either looking around because i you know so many times we're on a on a river or we're in a boat and we don't see what's around us because we're watching our fly we just constantly watch our fly that's all we saw all day long was our fly and i remind myself to look up once in a while and i and i miss fish then and and i'm okay with that you know because it's the ability to do that and and then you know and then i i miss fish because when it's a really slow time like there are those times when the fish don't bite for a couple hours and i become lazy and i don't expect there to be a fish there and so then when there is i miss it because i'm not ready for it i'm not alert you know i watched that the other day you were talking about that's interesting you were talking about that i watched that just the other day of fishing got slow for about 30 minutes for us and, and the guy in the front of the boat started talking about all the reasons why he thought maybe we weren't catching fish all of a sudden a front coming in the sun came out the he just went through this laundry list of things that we've all said and the guy in the back of the boat's just constantly catching fish i thought there's a lot of mindset here too of this I, guy in the front is like here's the reasons why i'm not catching anything and the guy in the back is like well i haven't heard any of the reasons because i've been focusing i've been able to focus and this was probably this is after lunch so it's probably about six hours mm-hmm. six about the six hour mark on the river and the guy in the front was getting a little tired is really all it was uh-huh. but you know a little bit later he sat down he 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 had a snickers uh, (laughs) and you know he refreshed a minute and then went back to catching fish he's like okay well uh, you know maybe this happened and i'm thinking maybe you just took a breather and now you feel better right exactly maybe you're a little fresher yeah and you know i think too when we're tired or when we don't believe in the fly that we have we fish it differently yeah Oh, you know, and it no makes a huge that. difference if you're fishing if you have a fly on that you caught a fish on or you're really confident on you just fish that better you're a better hunter that way and and uh when you have that fly on that you're not really sure about you just don't fish it the right way and i think it's you know the wrong fly is the right fly sometime right and so it, <laughs> it you it doesn't matter i think sometimes it doesn't matter the fly in the end it can but sometimes it doesn't matter depending on what you're fishing for it's the way that you present it yeah it's presentation mm-hmm. and we've talked about that millions of times on the, on the boat on the podcast we've talked about that with various people 
my philosophy is is get a fly you have confidence in and learn how to fish it and you don't have to change and and i know people that change flies every five minutes and they still catch fish and they're still my friends yeah (laughs) (laughs) but but if you can especially a streamer if you can find a streamer that you like and you have confidence in you'll figure out how to fish that thing various ways many different ways and you'll catch fish all of those ways because you'll be focused on it and you i don't know i don't want to say you've got something to prove with it but really in your mind you're like i should catch a fish with this fly streamers are especially that way for me yeah and it could be a woolly bugger and if it is that's fine too yeah i I used to say woolly buggers are bait but i don't say that anymore (laughs) uh because you know they they catch fish and yeah i mean that's the first tie that i learned uh fly that i learned to tie was yeah. the woolly bugger and it was crazy because it still works to this day it still works you know yeah that's a great fly yeah i'm, I'm sure somebody's out there just passing out because they heard me say that i'm sure <laughs> that's right they'll get over it they <laughs> they'll <will>. wake up <laughs> that's right. sooner or later that's right so you've got your own own drift boat captain and you can do you have to row too yeah well yeah. i'm a very bad rower uh, i have a friend jerry meyer she owns the driftless angler in wisconsin and she says they don't use drift boats there, but she has the perfect example for how I also row a drift boat is the same way she does. It's like, there's a rock, 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 don't hit the rock, rock, oh, smash right into the rock, you know? And so it's like, the more I try to avoid things, the more I hit them. And so you probably don't want me to row you around, but I can if I have to. So I've got one friend that if you if you put him in the rower's seat, all of a sudden he can't row, he can't read water, he can't do anything. <laughs> I put him in his own drift boat, totally different person. So you're not that type are you no i just can't row any drift boats okay all right so you're not selective (laughs) i'm not selective i try hard i give myself an a for effort but yeah i don't know that i'm the best drift boat rower there ever was but that's 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 a good way to learn how to read water is to get a drift boat and i'm not advocating everybody buy a drift boat but it is a good way to learn how to read water especially if you have to repair it you will learn how to read water pretty quick oh yeah oh yeah (laughs) right well and i find that you know as soon as we got a drift boat uh you don't fish anymore. You row. All of a sudden, everybody else is fishing. Right, right. Uh-huh. That's exactly the way it is. Uh, let's talk about where you live here, land between the lakes. What all types of water do you have? Is it just all lakes or? Yeah, so um, it's the Tennessee River Dam to make Kentucky Lake on the west side, and then the Cumberland River that is Dam to make Bar- Lake Barkley on the east side. And there are a lot of tributaries off of that. They stock trout here, even in this little area right around here, they stock trout, but it's really just put and take. I mean, if the guys could come with buckets at the sit at the back of the <laughs> truck, they would, you know? So, which, you know, as, as the, only a catch and release person, it, and not because I don't believe that you can take trout, because I do, you know, you legally can take fish, you should take them if you want to you know if you're going to use them and and eat them that's fine that's your prerogative for me i don't mostly because i don't like to clean fish you know so i just throw them all back and but more than that i i i'm i'm a very sensitive person when it comes to animals i really like animals and so even a fish you know for me is a living breathing entity and i I feel bad when I hook it, and so I put it back in the water carefully. <laughs> I know it's a blood sport, but I'm still a little sensitive that way. Um, but, you know, some of the stuff that the put and take that drives me crazy around this area is, in any area, I guess I've seen it in Wisconsin too, is just the, the manhandling of the fish and just total disregard for them. I mean, I know they're stock trout, but they're still alive, you know? And so I, I don't I don't understand that part of it. But, um, yeah, so around here, put and takes, but uh, trout would be the only way that we have trout in this area but um because we're on the west side of the state you know on the east side is all the trout and over here there's not but it's all bass it's bass and chain pickerel and gar and i mean there's catfish in there that kind of stuff but other than that it's mostly bass in this area there's two that's two types of fish that i haven't caught the chain pickerel i haven't caught one of those on the fly or catfish i think i've always wanted to catch a catfish on catfish the fly that's scared that pants off of me when they take holy cow they're just so strong and so sudden that that they catch me off guard every time you know we we did a my friends and i've got a close group of friends there's in and out there's six or seven of us that that are in this little group but Mm -hmm. we we had a uh trash and bass competition one time what is that so trash and bass uh, thank you for asking (laughs) is uh so it, it was no trout. There were no trout, and you, it's, it's, it's a bass tournament that happened throughout the whole summer. And it was just our group. You had to, since we're all liars, 
you had to uh, show a picture of it, preferably with a ruler or beside your fly rod. Had to be caught on the fly, uh, and you had to submit your photo to the group. And whoever had the largest of each warm water species, and we had a list of species: largemouth, smallmouth, bluegill, gar, just all warm water stuff. We just had this tournament. It was our trash and trash and trash and bass tournament that's awesome yeah and you know we the guy that put it together friend of ours that put it together he gave trophies you know and and it was just it was so much so much fun yeah it sounds like fun you know whenever i would get done trout fishing for the day i'd you know i'd call it the very last day so it had a time starting time and ending time the starting time was whenever the first one of us catches a fish on the list that was the starting time Hmm. The ending time was like four months later, three months later, throughout uh-huh. the whole summer and part of spring. And uh, so it was getting down to the last minute, like the last day. And I'm on the phone with my other friends saying, hey, do you know anybody that has like a, a pond with catfish in it? Because this is the only one that I don't think that I have a big enough fish to win. You know, this is the, this I need to win. And I never did catch one. I, I almost, so on the way to the Obey, I almost stopped at the, like this catfish farm up there. <laughs> But I, you know, the I just I guess I felt bad, and I still had some some of that in me to where I thought I shouldn't do this. But yeah, I passed by it on the way to the Obey, and I passed by it on the way back. And both times I slowed down, and I was like, Oh man, if I could, that's what I need to do. I couldn't bring myself to do it. Uh-huh. But I am going to catch a catfish, a catfish, and a, and a tarpon. I need to catch that tarpon yeah. too. So oh well, there's like two completely different. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, and that goes back to you don't necessarily have to just trout fish with with uh with a fly rod which is you see that on the commercials yeah there's that one i don't know what the commercial is uh but it's got the guy that casts really bad the old guy casts really bad he's in a trout stream and and you know and then there's a river runs through it you know all those things make people think oh well if i had trout around here i would i might take up fly fishing right but it's not that way you can fish for anything right yeah absolutely thank goodness because otherwise i I wouldn't be fishing. Right. Or you'd have to move. Yeah. One of I'd have two. to move. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, Jen, it's been, it's the, the rain has stopped, by the way. I don't know if you've noticed, but it stopped out there. Finally. And I can't hear it on the, on the tin roof anymore. Uh, I really appreciate you inviting me to the world headquarters of Dunn Magazine. What Thank a great you. place up here on the hill. Just super, super laid back. A lot of, a lot of good things happen out of this place. Yeah, well, thank you. You'll have to come back and fish with us. I will. I need to do that, and you need to come down. And, and we had talked one time about doing the musky thing, so we need to get back together and, and do that at the beginning of the season. It's, yeah, that'd it's be about, fun. It's about done for me now. And there's always next year. But uh, So you've been listening to Southeastern Fly, The Angler's Influence. we talked to, been talking with Jen Ripple of uh, Dunn Magazine, and we appreciate you stopping by. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Thank you.